member of government. So she can the government. And you're there, please. Um, and the second is Dasha. She may please. Okay, thank you. Member of government. Uh, Hansen. First speaking for Hansen. Here they. Okay. I will speak in second. Here they. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder about timing. Uh, you'll have one bang at six minutes, two bangs at seven. Uh, at which point you're supposed to start wrapping up. After 15 seconds, you'll hear three bangs. Just finish the sentence you're on. Uh, we prefer not to have to bang anyone out, uh, but please don't take advantage. We'll stop writing at this point. Uh, a reminder not to be rude or heckle each other or uh, abuse each other with too many points of information. You're sitting very close to each other, so try not to speak too loud. Uh, and Without any further ado, I will call on the Prime Minister to begin the debate. Oh, and sorry, uh, that also goes for the audience. Please, uh, small echo of your room. Please don't be rude to any of the speakers and try not to make a noise during the speeches. <laughs> Substantial risk that we think it is justified in order to restrict their sales to companies and to countries that do not meaningfully contain those type of risks. We think it is highly likely that the overprescription of these types of antibiotics leads to me medicine being less effective in the long run because people become resistant to it and other type of bacteria become resistant to it. And there's also a tail risk of massive pandemics that can be ultimately disastrous. We're willing to accept short term risks that people cannot get access to antibiotics in order to be able to contain these long term risks. Our model is simply going to be that we're going to extend the general enforcement mechanism that the WHO uses to this type of policy, by which means that if countries continue to export uh, antibiotics to countries that are not in compliance with the general agricultural and medical rules, we will say that they do not get other WHO protections regarding things like patent protection, regarding things with cooperation, regarding the outbreaks of diseases, etc. Three things we're going to talk about. First off, why it is that we think that this type of mechanism we're going to use is actually likely to work and why people are likely to be in compliance. Let's break it off into the different types of actors that would be affected by this policy. First off, for countries that manufacture substantial amounts of pharmaceuticals, but are nonetheless not broadly compliant with these type of rules. Yeah, what's up? So are you going to just stop access to WHO protection only, or are you going to literally stop the drug from actually getting to those countries? I would think we prefer to stop the drugs from entering country, but the WHO doesn't have a navy and doesn't have a military, so we can't physically do that. So we're going to use any leverage we can to try to stop it, which is generally trying to revoke the existing protections that it has. Okay, so let's first talk about the countries that manufacture lots of drugs and are largely in compliance with these type of rules. These are generally countries, for instance, in the European Union, like Switzerland, which have major pharmaceutical manufacturing capacities. The reason why they're likely to not export to most of the developing worlds is because they're highly reliant on the WHO for other protections. For example, in the European Union, the main competitors for the production of pharmaceutical products are the United States. They use WHO, WHO protections largely to prevent the United States and these other, like, other countries that manufacture it from engaging in exploitative practices, from just dumping pharmaceutical products onto foreign markets. So as a result, they are super scared of losing these type of WHO protections. Second off, we think that even non-compliant countries, countries like China and the United States that produ produce pharmaceuticals but don't really abide by these type of rules, also have incentives to try to uh, comply with this. Why? Well, one, they still rely on the WHO rules to a certain extent to prevent their competitors from just dumping products. And But second off, they also need it because the main amount of money that they make in terms of their export markets is not exported to the developing world where most non-compliant countries exist, but rather exporting to other developed countries such as the European Union. Insofar as the European Union is likely to be compliant with these type of measures, they have very strong incentives in order to not lose access to those type of markets to be able to comply with these measures. Moreover, we think complying with these measures isn't particularly difficult. You don't need to be able to dump a mass amount of antibiotics into the feeds of your cows in order to be able to make them grow large. You just need to have a basic compliance regime with basic amount of regulations that do not require costs, so we do think this is likely to be enforced. So why does it matter this is enforced? First reason is why we're able to substantially curtail the risk of antibiotic resistance. Two, we think that antibiotic resistance is bad for two reasons. First off, it's that it makes the drugs less effective in the long run, because you have to have prescribe larger and larger quantities of this drug in order to be able to be to have the same effect, because the bacteria is becoming increasingly resistant. Moreover, 
over, we think there's a possible risk that this also transmutes to humans in the case of where this is being fed to animals. Second off, there's a tail risk of a pandemic in the fact that when you, if you have some sort of new, uh, new uh, bug emerges and we try to ramp up our production capacities in order to be able to stop it, and we simply do not have the ability to do so because these bugs are largely resistant. Because note that if you're okay. resistant to one particular drug, that means you also have a lot of similarities with other drugs. Generally, they rely on similar molecules and have similar chemical compositions, which means that there is a substantial risk in the long run that we develop a pandemic that could literally kill millions of people. Because the substantial amounts of international trade and international travel we have right now means a pandemic in one country is likely to spread to other countries. Even if that is a tiny risk, we're willing to stop the sale of antibiotics in the short run in order to be able to stop that type of tail risk of a pandemic. Why is that we actually help reduce this? Why is compliance help reduce this? First off, we literally prevent the overprescription of antibiotics because people have to be compliant with the measures that literally prevent it from happening. Second off, we think we're likely to create the spreading of local industries. That is, that in countries that are somehow they cannot set up a compliance regime for whatever reason, so in the worst case, they don't set it up, what do they do? Well, they still want to have some access to antibiotics. They're likely to try to encourage the development of local industries. Why does this matter? Well, it means that they're better able to stop, for instance, a very quick outbreak or the outbreak of a particular disease that might be only a problem in their particular country, but doesn't have global ramifications, so there isn't the type of incentives globally for the United States, China, or the European Union to manufacture it. So as a result, we think that we get better production of drugs to stop those types of diseases. Third off, we get better innovation because we think that broadly speaking, if the country that is very large and is a large market is uncompliant, we think that the United States and those type of pharmaceutical manufacturers still want to make money. So what are they going to do? Try to find substitutes for the type of antibiotics so that they can still be able to manufacture it. There are large precedents being able to do with it. For example, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a substantial risk to which dehydration as caused by diarrhea was killing literally millions of people in South Asia. Non-antibiotic solutions that were literally just saline drops that were able to help people retain those waters were able to save millions of lives. There, when there is an incentive to do so, people can produce these type of alternatives that can better save lives in the long run. Is there a question below? Yeah, so we care about resistance because we want people to be able to be treated by drugs, right? I mean, yeah, we want people to survive diseases. That doesn't necessarily mean drugs. Any type of mechanism by which we can help people survive, whether that's through antibiotics or not, or antiviral treatments, we're totally fine with. Last argument we're going to present is why this is that it actually helps strengthen the WTO institutionally. Because one of the main reticence that the WHO has instituting draconian policies like this is they don't want to have backlash towards their type of regime. Why is it that we better strengthen WHO to enforce all their other measures? First off, this is creates tangible, tangible costs to violating WTO protocols. That is, when people are trying to balance concerns in the future of whether or not I should violate WTO, WHO protocol, they think, well, maybe there aren't going to be costs. The fact that the WHO is putting substantial costs in the short run means that they are likely to believe that their, their word has more weight. Second off, it lends substantial amount of credence, because note that one of the non-compliant countries that exist is the United States. I suspect that China is also largely non-compliant. Well, one of the main reasons why people don't often cooperate with international organizations, they think they're just in the pockets of the US and the other major powers. By literally saying that we're going to provide costs to them, we think it gives greater credence and greater buy-in to these type of organizations. Third, we think it incentivizes a greater creation of a compliance regime. Note how a developing country were to comply with this type of regime. They need to set up regulations to prevent their farmers from overprescribing it, to have documentation of hospitals to prevent them from overprescribing uh, antibiotics. That doesn't just have benefits with antibiotics, that has general benefits with being able to better track patients, it has general benefits for being better able to provide care and other compliance with WHO regulations, which is another reason we're so proud to propose. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you to the Prime Minister. Uh, we call on the Leader of Opposition to introduce the clash. The problem with opening government is this. They fear a pandemic tomorrow. They fear a pandemic a year from now. 
That is not the reality in most states that do not have compliant regimes. Because the reality is that either these states are unable to build the infrastructure that forms the compliance regime, or more crucially, they already have pandemics on the ground that they need to deal with. Opening government wants to solve a problem that happens 10 years from now. We say it's more important to stop pandemics now. I'm going to do three things in this speech. First, I'm going to tackle whatever the opening government gave you. Then I want to chat a little bit about framing what we think the regulations look like. Because if you actually listen to opening government, they literally never told you what these kinds of regulations on medicinal use were. Then I want to talk about the arguments. Why states are likely to do things that are far worse, and why the WHO is likely itself to be politically coercive. First, I want to chat about what we think these regulations overwhelmingly look like. I think in the vast majority of cases, the countries that do not form compliance regimes are the ones that fail to do so for several reasons. One, they are already dealing with pandemics. So they can't follow WHO regulations that say you have to implement phase one of the drug now, phase two of the drug in six months, and phase three of the drug in 18 months. Or they are likely to not have the infrastructure to do things like follow quarantine, like follow the full extent of quarantine regulations that the WHO has. I think those are overwhelming the cases over countries that receive drugs themselves or non-compliant. I want to talk about how this interacts with a PM. What we hear from the PM is two things. One, this mechanism is likely to be effective, and two, this mechanism is likely to be good. We're going to tell you about why the mechanism is ineffective, but even if the mechanism works, why is this likely to be harmful? Because what the PM tells you is this. It decreases the risk of antibiotic resistance. But I think a POI from Tejal quite clearly explains that the only reason we care about people being resistant, or like drugs being resistant to the antibiotics is very simple, because that increases the risk of pandemics later on. But the problem is insofar that people have the disease right now, like the option that you have is not treating a bunch of people that currently have the disease, which obviously inherently increases the risks that other people People come into contact with the disease, that pandemics are much more likely to spread. The comparative is very simple. If you believe any of the opening government material about why companies are likely to want to make alternatives, I think obviously if they understand that drugs are resistant, it's a really easy market for them to build like even better, even stronger uh, like antibiotics. I think this is the way that you solve all the problems with opening government. Because insofar that they tell you that you want to be able to fund substitutes for antibiotics, I think companies are much likely to do this, even on our side of the house, because obviously they know if vast swaths of diseases are resistant to antibiotics, there needs to be some sort of alternative. Opening government's material is ineffective. The rest of the stuff I'll talk about will be integrated. First, I want to chat about the black market. Because the big problem with opening government is that they don't actually understand how the sale of drugs works, especially in states that do not have compliance regimes right now. Because I think these sorts of diseases that antibiotics is likely to affect are the kinds of diseases in which people are desperate to find a cure. Things like tuberculosis, things like malaria, in which both people and countries know that if there isn't a cure, if they don't get the antibiotics that are necessary, traditional methods of solving these problems don't work. So even in the developing world, I think people are likely to do things like sacrifice their jobs, sacrifice food. This is why you literally see people like carting each other to hospitals in order to get the treatment of the next antibiotic. The problem is extraordinarily simple. On their side of the house, you do not allow these people to get access to the best form of the regulated drugs, which is why people tend to turn to things like the black market. You see this all of the time. When the sale of like antiretrovirals in like, uh, in like Kenya was regulated, or the sale of vaccines was regulated to states like Thailand, they were much more likely to rely on things like the black market. I want to talk about why this is extraordinarily harmful. First, I think you are unlikely to ever control quantities or dosage. Understand that the problem with opening government was this. They wanted to talk a lot about how when you weren't likely to follow quantities, uh, like regulations, when you weren't likely to follow dosage regulations, that was the point at which pandemics were much more likely to spread because you were much more likely to get things like super bugs. It is incoherent to think that this does not worsen on their side of the house insofar as the way that people are now exchanging drugs is through the black market. That is, I think that when you have like a lot of, when you concentrate a lot of medicine, especially like when people are much more likely to take pills because all of a sudden it's being provided by the black market rather than a regulated infrastructure, they're likely to do the sorts of things that leads to higher concentrations of medicine, which is much more likely to thing, do things like create superbugs because it creates like a lot more environmental pressure within the body to mutate. That is why I think you are much more likely to get resistant bacteria on their side of the house. Section: people are likely to do things like turn to the black market, which means they are much more likely to find things like counterfeit drugs. The biggest problem in the developing world right now is very simple. You cannot ensure the quality of drugs, but you can't even ensure that the drug is supposed to do what it was meant to do. So you see a very big problem where like counterfeit drugs is like a billion dollar industry because so many people understand that these people are absolutely desperate and into what they have no other alternatives are going to rely on things like counterfeit drugs, things that are much more likely to kill you even if they don't solve the problem that you were there for in the first place. And three, I think all the kinds of regulations about quarantine, you are much less likely to enforce. 
Look, it is comparatively better when people are able to take drugs in a somewhat quarantined environment on a somewhat dosage level rather than risking the black market, which is much, much worse. I'll take closing. So the problem is the government mechanism is that all these countries have to do is to prove that they're taking steps. I think by your own argumentation, most people would rather take a smaller, more controlled dose than take a black market dose. So this has literally no impact. So, insofar as these countries cannot set up compliance regimes, or they are much more likely to do scary things because they think that the pandemic is so scary, they are unlikely to comply with whatever the opening government enactment mechanism is. Either way, I think you have to be willing to say that there are some countries that are obviously going to get shut out from the production of drugs. This is extremely problematic. I want to talk now about why the WHO regulations does work. This deals with the best case scenario of opening government. Because I think the big problem is all they presume is that these things are medically appropriate. <coughs> I want to talk about why things like superbugs are likely to develop on either side of the house. Because I think the problem with opening government is this. They fail to recognize that if you inculcate vast swaths of the population with antibiotics, insofar that these countries are thought to be compliant, you are still likely to lead to superbugs. Because if everyone is compliant, I think that bacteria are still likely to rise up anyway. The problem is, what they want to do, is they want to say that maybe these regulations are going to work somewhat, maybe these regulations are going to work in preventing pandemics from five to ten years, but it doesn't actually stop the worst instances. Countervailingly, what are the incentives that countries have within the WHO to do the worst kinds of stuff? Because I think the WHO is run by a lot of big countries, even if opening government thinks that like, there's some way you can insulate yourself from that. Because I think right now, countries that have disproportionate amounts of voting power or disproportionate amounts on what scientists are selected to the boards, what scientists are like appointed to all the governing bodies of the WHO, or really large nations with really large pharmaceutical industries, things like the European Union, things like the US, things like China. Why are there bad motivations to use this policy very badly? First, in terms of economics. Insofar, the US and the European Union are very afraid that their pharmaceutical industry is likely to face competition and it's likely not to get some like, the IP regulations in the developing world. I think they're likely to use this sort of mechanism to say, ha, ah, these are the kinds of standards that we want you, you to have to comply with. They make these things insanely hard and they use it to restrict the sale to things uh, to like countries in the developing world. But you see this overwhelmingly in other cases as well, where China has political motivations to make sure that like Taiwan can't get access to drugs. So when the SARS pandemic happened in Taiwan five years ago, China tried to use their WHO lobby power to ensure that Taiwan didn't get access to drugs. You are much more likely to have that on their side of the house when countries can set arbitrary compliance standards and say, now we can restrict the sale of any drugs to these people in these countries. For all these reasons, very, very proud to have Leader of the opposition, we call on the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the debate. in these cases. What I'm going to do in this speech is explain to you why it is, one, not very costly for either the developed world or the developing world to follow these regulations, and number two, why it would be incredibly costly for them not to follow the regulations, which would incentivize them to allocate the resources that are necessary to do this, but it's not going to be that much because it's just not that costly. The other thing to note, though, is that the long term here is more important. They don't engage on this. So we do tell you that the antibiotic use itself causes the pandemic in the first place because it creates the microbes that exist. So the malaria stuff, other than the fact that malaria is viral, doesn't really make sense because the reason why we have these superbugs is the use of the antibiotics in the first place. So it's not clear that they're solving any problems by using them in the immediate term. It was just bluster to say that they solve current problems. Okay, first thing that I want to talk about is a little bit of rebuttal to their case. First of all, they say if there's no compliance regime, then you're going to have a pandemic and now there's lots of pandemics happening now. Number one, gut check this. We think that there are pandemics that are recurrent in certain countries with weak health infrastructures, but you probably would have heard about one the way that you heard about Ebola when it was happening, so we don't think that this is true. But number two, to the degree that this is happening, it's a huge mechanistic quibble on their part. We told you that we think that we're going to get a meaningful amount of compliance to the degree that we told you exactly how we're going to do this, right? We'll take away their protections. And what we said these regulations are is very clear. Quotas for using these things, not using them in agriculture, etc. Very clear regulations as to what you should do. Okay, why do we get meaningful compliance in our case? Number one, 
we think that it's very cheap to follow this because the reasons why doctors are often using these drugs in the first place is just the disposition that they have to use them because they think it's the easiest way out. And so they basically shirk alternatives that are almost just as easy. This acts as a nudge because then all you need is a basic level of monitoring and a basic amount of enforcement of the regulations, which says just don't use the antibiotic as your first thing to defer to. Have a guideline that says that that is the last resort. What then happens when you do that? People don't use it. They use things like saline drops when it's relevant. They use things that are not antibiotics, even in a lot of cases where people just need like water and rest, they oftentimes get antibiotics and those things just like are prescribed by doctors because they're risk averse in the short term. So you're bringing doctors' incentives into alignment with what they really should be doing because the individual incentive of the doctor does not square with the collective incentive, uh, sorry, with the collective interest of the health system because they have an incentive to nip something in the bud or perceive that they're nipping in the bud, but really what they're doing is making it worse on the aggregate for health outcomes. The other thing to note here about why it's really cheap to follow is a lot of the times the reason why you have these bad agricultural practices in the developing world where you use antibiotics is that they're following the United States and other developing developed countries because they think that that's something that these countries want to see because there's a norm around it or they just think that it's a good practice. The reason we, but we know it's a bad practice and the reason why you get following is because we told you for the US and the EU it's very likely that you do get massive amounts of compliance to the degree that they massively rely on the WHO to one, coordinate their interactions with regard to their drug markets, and two, to the degree that it's also just a disposition that doctors have, and so it's pretty easy to nudge doctors in the developed world as well, where regular regulatory regimes are already strong. What is the implication? That everything that they talked about, about pandemics, etc., really doesn't make sense, because you do get an amount of compliance, and you do get actual change. But even if you were to get like the short-term harms that they talked about, we could accept those costs, and I think we would still be coming out on top. Why? because the outcomes here are vastly worse, right? If one pandemic or outbreak was to spiral out of control now in one country, we think that it would be much worse to have future pandemics in other cases because, because, you, do, because, of the, because you really have these bad regulatory regimes. I think 10 pandemics is probably worse than the rest of them. I'll take closing if you have them. Opening? Okay, great. So the other thing that they say is that like, you're just going to incentivize the black market and basically they think that that means that we also don't get compliance. Here's the reason why they don't get meaningful amounts of black market incentives. So number one, a lot of these countries are scared that there's going to be a retaliation on other measures. Because people in countries often view international laws as being bundled together meaningfully. So the reason that they don't violate an individual WHO regulation, even though it might not be in the particular interest, is they're worried that that's going to lead to other harms, with, for instance, with regards to trade or with regards to other international law, because they think that other countries perceive them as a bundle of laws and legitimacy. The other thing though is that investors also incentivize this. So for instance, the fact is that when certain developing nation leaders, political leaders, violate small, seemingly insignificant uh, uh, like regulations that are like, in, or international norms or laws, the reason you get a lot of investor retaliation sometimes is even though that individual thing doesn't do much itself, it signals that the country isn't more, largely compliant with the regime. Point. These countries are, uh, are aware of this, and the reason that they're going to comply is exactly for that reason. Sure. Sure. So if there are investor reasons and other international law being bundled together reasons to comply with the regime anyway, why do you need a specific enforcement that says you just can't have these drugs if you don't follow the rules? No, because the idea is that you want to have it, you want the WHO to signal that this is one of the regulations that they actually care about and actually want to enforce. The, the fact is that you just need to have a cost. These are unenforced regulations. So it's not enough for them to say that, oh, it's a regulation. There's tons of stuff on the books. But countries also need a way to pick which ones that they're supposed to follow. And imposing a cost and saying, this is one that we are actually going to go behind is important because what it tells them is you need to follow this one in this individual case because of the aggregate case as well. Okay, the next thing that they say is that you, you're going to just incentivize uh, new drugs, etc. Here's the problem, like, like, this incentivizes the pharmaceutical industry just to make new drugs so it's not a real problem. Number one, it's super hard to research and it's not just an open and shut question that you can always do this sort of thing. So it's better to under-prescribe because you don't know what the severity of the pandemic is going to be in the future. Second of all, it's often out of line with the profit incentives of, inf of pharmaceutical companies to do this sort of thing because if they're making massive amounts of profit now, it's not clear why they're going to be so far-sighted when investors see that and trade off by adding much more to research and development. That means that on their side, they don't get more drugs, they don't get more of this, and that's why it doesn't occur.
Look, the reality is that if the United States and the EU follow this, we think that the rest of the developing world is going to follow suit because of the signals that it sends and because of the enforcement power that it gives the WHO to do these sorts of things because once they have the largest actors on board, they know that they can do these sorts of things. But even if they didn't have them fully on board, we still get a meaningful amount of enforcement when an international institution signals that this is a regulation that they actually care about. The impacts and consequences are massive and dwarfs whatever they talk about. Number one, more pandemics. Number two, the actual development of health infrastructure in a lot of these countries by incentivizing them to do these sorts of things, which gets rid of some, a lot of the problems that they talk about. Because it's not enough to have the drug, you also need delivery mechanisms for drugs, you need an infrastructure that can combat these sorts of things and be preventative. The thesis of our case was, we think that you need this regulation now to make the WHO an institution that is meaningfully preventative and not just reactionary in a way that consigns it to being short-termist and not solving any of the problems. We bring the incentives of doctors in these nations into line with the long-term incentive of the health of the world. We are incredibly proud to propose. Medical 
drugs, it makes it more likely that you develop these antibiotic resistances because you're taking concentrations that are unsafe. Or two, you're taking forms of the drugs that don't help you, which means people are literally dying. We think that means that either you get an increased spread of these sorts of pandemics, or you get people that are literally unable to access basic health care, which is a higher order issue. But secondarily, he told you that the WHO is not the actor that determines these regulations as optimal for different parts of the world. Because he told you there's an incentive for actors, for example, like Western nations that have very strong IP laws to make sure, and because they're lobbied by individual corporations within their borders, to make sure they do things like protect the use of these drugs so that you have to use a, buy a certain amount from corporations that have a, a high ability to lobby, which means that instead of doing things where individual nations can optimize for themselves or individual hospitals can make decisions like, look, we can't quarantine this person perfectly, but they're going to die. We should be giving them this drug and the amount that we have. They cannot make that decision because some external actor in the WHO has decided that it's not the optimal way to regulate. We think instead, just having guidelines, which we can do on our side of the house, is sufficient to give them the information they need to make these sorts of signals. Okay, now I'm actually going to talk about why antibiotic resistance is actually not a huge problem. All they say on this is they say, one, these drugs are really difficult to research, and two, there's no profit incentive to address it. But I think it's quite the opposite. Firstly, note that there's a high demand for the treatment of antibiotic resistant strains of drugs insofar as the reason they have become resistant, right, for something to become resistant or you to know that it's going to be resistant is that a lot of people are using that drug in the first place, right? That's the way that these, these, these bacteria are able to become resistant, which means that there's a lot of use of this sort of thing, and it's probably very widespread, and it's also probably very well studied because the way you were able to make the first drug that made the bacteria resistant is you had to have studied that disease or that sort of pesticide in the first place. That means that these are the sorts of areas where companies have the most profit incentive because they know there's a huge market and there's a high level of demand that they want to meet, which means that the idea that you're going to cause a global pandemic by giving people a drug that allows them to treat multi-drug resistant TB is probably nonsensical because companies then have even more of an incentive to do the sorts of innovations that actually save lives. Compare that with the comparison that they gave you, which is that people literally do not have access to drugs that will help them right now or have long-term strategies that, that will make success better. Okay. Now, finally, I'll take a point from closing, actually. Oh, no, we're okay. Do you guys never contest that there isn't an incentive for these countries that are importing to comply, just so they have the capacity to do so? But there isn't a technological barrier here, just at worst costs of money. If it is true it is as bad as you say to not comply, then governments who are democratically elected and don't want to vote a backlash are going to spend that money. Okay. The thesis of their case is that there needs to be a cost imposed for people to take these actions. We told you there's already a cost for my intro where I told you when people die, it looks really bad if you're not being able to be sustainable and you're later dying of a multi-drug resistant disease or your crops are not sustainable. That's already a cost. The relevant cost is, do you sacrifice other places that your resources are going? If you have a, the reason you're not complying is because you have a limited amount of resources or you don't have the, like the prioritization you're making is not to fully following certain types of regulations to give some amount of care. We tell you that cost is not the optimal cost to take on because rather it should be people being able to make optimal allocations about what sorts of things they're going to be advocating for as compared to other things. But also, so basically that countries are, have this incentive. What they tell us is that countries have an incentive to follow what the U.S. does. First of all, note that the U.S. has a large hand in shaping what WHO regulations look like, not just because of their political power, but also because a lot of these drug makers are established in the United States and have the ability to further these sorts of IP protections in the first place. But also we think, insofar as these, these sorts of agents that are best able to optimize things for themselves are usually people that are existing in other types of medical professions anyway, we think that they likely have external forms of training that are to solve regardless of which side of the house that they are on, which means the relevant way you're doing here is not like sort of like which country has the best incentive to make the world a better place, but rather do you block people from the ability to access the sorts of healthcare that they need in any particular moment? So what's the relevant way in the round? If you believe that a global pandemic is super scary and you need to be able to fight it, remember we better incentivize companies to actually be able to create the sorts of drugs that are going to be able to like treat multi-drug resistant forms of disease. But also we tell you these sorts of like very scary pandemics exist right now. And the question is, do you definitely solve a problem that exists right now? Or do you exist affect a hypothetical problem that has some sort of tail risk? But we've also told you that it like definitely discriminates against the sorts of actors that are better able to make decisions for themselves, which we tell you is not something that the WHO is in a position to make. Which means that if you think a hospital has an incentive to help people and is not irrational and cares about them being able to be safe and healthy, which is why they joined, they're able to make that decision better on their own. DLO, we call on the member of government to introduce their extension.
I think the opening half has missed this debate. They've missed this debate in two ways. First, that pharmaceutical companies have a financial incentive to create antibiotic resistance because it drives up the values of the patents that they're holding, it drives up the value of the drugs that they will bring to market in the future. Second, that drugs are not the way to stop pandemics. The way to stop pandemics is to stop big pharmaceutical companies from being able to lobby governments into keeping sanitation conditions extremely low in the developing world and in megacities whilst flooding the market with low-cost generic drugs. What all of this means is I think both opening teams are going to lose strategically massive ground in the round. And our extension about changing government behavior and changing big pharma behavior is of immense importance. Before that, though, some outstanding bits of the rebuttal, the rest of it's going to be integrated. The first thing that we get essentially from opening opposition, the crux of their case, is it's going to be very difficult and expensive for people to implement these conditions. And so consequently, lots of these countries are going to resolve their pandemics. One, the response I gave you in the point of information was that it's actually very easy to implement lots of these things. And all that these gov governments have to show is that they are taking steps. To that end, I think they're likely to, like the characterization that they give of like cutting everyone off from access to these drugs, is probably unreasonable. Second of all, and this is our extension, the pandemics are actually most effectively not stopped by drugs. They are stopped by the transmission of the disease in the first place. That's what the drug does, right? It stops you transferring person A plus B. The best way you can do that is to not like live in a fucking 10-person bedroom with all a whole bunch of other people, to have open latrines in the middle of cities. That is the reason disease is transferred, not because everyone's not hopped up on antibiotics. Second element they bring is that black market drugs increase. One, again, the taking steps response is to say that that's unlikely. But second of all, most importantly, notice that all of the logic they give you as to why black market drugs are bad are reasons why a person would choose our model rather than the black market. That is to say, that's why a person would take perhaps a smaller dose, a more controlled dose, but a dose they know will work, and a dose they know is being given to everyone else, to other members of their family, for example, rather than one they sell by like a, a sketchy dude in a back street in the back of a Volvo. Two arguments. One, change government behavior. Two, change big pharma behavior. On the first, changing government behavior. Opening opposition say drugs are the way to stop pandemics. The problem is there are many, many ways to stop pandemics. The crucial context you need for this round is that drugs are being used as a quick fix to the stop of pandemics. That is, you have big pharmaceutical companies, specifically those that produce generics in states like China and India, lobbying the government directly to, you know, like, to provide them with protections and to keep the sale of those drugs high. And as a direct response, the government doesn't do things like improving sanitation standards because it drives up the demand for those drugs. It means that they don't do things like improving living standards or handing out condoms because, again, it drives up the demand for those drugs. The second thing to say here under context is that all drugs will fail at some stage. Factually, there is a limited number of combinations of compounds that exist. And so what this means is that if we can show you we create a world in which the dependency on drugs in the first place is much, much lower, we have to win because there is a limited number of drugs we can possibly use on planet Earth in the future. The best world is one in which we have sanitation, not drugs. So how do we change government behavior? Two things. First, we increase the likelihood that populations lobby governments. That is to say that in lots of uh, countries, specifically developing economies, governments have pursued development at a direct cost to quality of life. See the mega cities round with all of the problems of overpopulation and sanitation problems that are produced there. Those come in a direct trade-off to providing development. The problem is, and the reason governments can get away with this, is that when drug prices are so low in China and India, the government doesn't have to think about sanitation, doesn't have to think about quality of life, because people just go along to a pharmacy and buy a very cheap drug to solve that problem. At the point at which potentially, yes, the price of these drugs are slightly higher, and potentially, yes, some people are being infected in the short run, the massive trade-off and the massive impact we bring you is that governments can no longer stand idly by and allow sanitation to be so awful, to allow latrines to run through the streets, to allow overcrowding in their urban populations, because one, that will harm their economy in the long run, and two, because more importantly, that people will rise up against them. Second of all, we decrease the ability for companies to buy off governments. This is a big problem, not just in the developing world, but in the US. Like, look at the contributions of Pfizer and GSK in terms of like, uh, like money exchange for political lobby. I can't remember what the noun for that is. It's like campaign finance, but that's it. Um, look at the prevalence of that even in like most developed economies. 
What this means is that if we decrease the amount of money that these pharmaceutical companies have access to, because they can no longer sell their drugs, like by the opening opposition logic about like um, black markets emerging or other competitors emerging, if we can increase, decrease the power of certain pharmaceutical companies, we decrease the hold they have over governments, and in turn decrease the lobbying power to pressure them to do things like not hand out condoms, pressure them to do things like not improve sanitation conditions. Why is this argumentation essential for the round? One, it takes out the opposition argument about pandemics, because pandemics are not so solved by giving everyone like, a small like a small dose of antibiotics. They're solved when you don't live in a room next to one, I sleep to next to a person like one foot away. They're solved when you don't have open latrines running through, through the streets of developed uh, by lots of uh, overcrowded cities. But second of all, that this is a massive swathe of benefits that are just like external to this domain. That is to say that we provide benefits not just for people who like are uh, who have diseases currently, but we provide all of the affiliated benefits of like increased sanitation for people that don't have diseases. We provide all of the affiliated the like, investment related benefits, for example, to lots of these economies when they don't have these problems. Second of all, how do we change the behavior of big pharmaceutical companies? The key framing for closing government, and the reason we're going to win this round, is that companies have a financial incentive to produce resistance. One, they sell more drugs. Two, new drugs are needed, and so that aids them in their fight against generic companies because they hold patents. Three, the patents that they do hold become much, much, much more valuable at the point at which existing drugs are failing. The change with this motion then is that exacerbating resistance or excelling resistance-based uh, products and like using that as your financial structure is no longer viable. I think the context here is that drugs already exist to solve the problems opposition highlights. That is, that Pfizer and GSK, no joke, have upwards of 10,000 antibiotic patents that are sat in an intellectual property vault because they know that in five, ten years' time, the value of those patents has come much, much higher. What do we change then under our side of the house? Point. This motion quite literally means that they are forced to release these patents, forced to release these drugs, because they cannot sell the existing ones. Last Two chance. things then. One, we are the team to solve the problem of resistance. Opening government talk about like resistance with currently existing drugs. What we tell you is that there they actually exist thousands of drugs we could be using, but aren't being, aren't, aren't being used because companies have a financial incentive to keep them locked away. But second of all, and in response to opening opposition, we also solve lots of their black market problems. Because Notice that black market drugs rely on, on drugs that exist already. Generic drugs rely on copying drugs that exist already. So if we massively increase the, like, on a factual basis, number of drug-based options available in the market, that is intuitively the point at which the black market is likely to get much, much better because they can go off drugs that actually work. So all of that stuff about like quantity of dosing, like whether these drugs are effective, whether they have adverse side effects, much better when we just have better drugs coming to market. The reason closing government is going to take this round over our opening is very simple. One, we provide not just the benefits of uh, decreasing resistance in a more potent form and get to the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue being the fact that the big farm companies have a financial incentive prol to proliferate resistance. But second of all, because we attack the problem at its root. This debate isn't about drugs, it's about sanitation. It's about whether or whether or not everyone should be dependent on drugs or whether we improve quality of life for people on the ground. I think that intuitively is a reason to cast your ballot for closing government. Very proud to close. Member of government, we call on the member of the opposition.
just because the government team wants the developing countries to change the way they do healthcare, to change the way their system functions, doesn't mean it can actually be changed. We think it's a very bad analysis at the point where they say, ah, government just don't care about people in these countries, therefore they just screw them over. We think that is wrong, right? We don't think that's a fair characterization. At best, it characterize the very worst of these developing countries. What we tell you is more like that happened. We tell you that these developing countries are not all dictatorships, are not all bad countries, right? They are just poor, poor but they do have things like democratic will and pressure. But what do we say happens under these countries? One will tell you, there's a lack of transmission of information. At a point which we say that people don't have things like basic education, basic healthcare, it means they don't understand diseases, but more importantly, they don't understand what is the meaning of the WHO imposition and sanction. But we will tell you, even if we change the incentive of the government to want to change the way their healthcare system functions, we tell you they literally can't. At the point which we say that you can't, for example, have a hospital near any village, where you can't have things like, say, access to even like toilets in a village, we think it's extremely hard for them to say, oh, but if we pressure the government, they can suddenly do that in the entire country. We think that's true. But secondly, we tell you, <laughs> WHO conventions are largely based upon a functioning and structurally good healthcare system, right? If you have a hospital, we think it's more likely that you're able to comply with the WHO conventions because they are made by and structured by Western companies with all these things in the very first place. What is the difference in these developing countries? Like? At the point which you don't have hospitals, you don't have things, at the point which the best healthcare you can get in a rural village in the middle of you know, pretty much nowhere, what you get is perhaps a, a, a medical van from say MSF or from say some government or uh, uh, governmental um, institution coming once a month that these things can never be compiled because they are structurally impossible to be built. But secondly, even if they want to build these things, it'll take them many, many years, right? They don't have the money, they don't have the people to build these things, we don't think they can change these things. At this point, we say that a pandemic they want to say they want to stop will happen more likely because what happens is in the gap of five or six years when they build things, pandem would, pandemics would already happen. Impact, right? Millions of people will literally die unless they remove their sanctions regime at the point which they are before. Anyway, uh, moving on, we tell you that there's no real incentive for the government to change anyway, right? What does this mean? At the point which we say that we, if you buy into the conception that the government do not care about the people, what does this mean? Even if the governments are probably corrupt, right? They're probably in incentivized to keep their own power structures, etc. So even if people are to face harms, we don't think they care. But secondly, what will government do even if, even if they claim, oh, electoral pressures? A, the fact that it's easier to literally blame the West and say they are imposing our values on them, they which hate them more, means the government will do these things. We see this in pretty much every single country, in which there was ever a, a, a peace giving force by the UN, right? Whereby, for example, the president of Sudan would be like, ah, you know, because I was charged by the uh, you know the international court that they are imposing their values on us. We think it's easier. On the, on the government side to use this as a narrative to, and to bind the people into not voting them out and by, by placing placating an anger of people by pushing it towards into an anger to all, all the West and say to try and like change the entire healthcare industry which is already almost non-existent in the very what first place. <laughs> uh, opening. Yeah, so it's not as expensive as you're talking about. To prevent overprescription antibiotics to uh, farm animals, you just don't feed them to farm animals. It's not even necessary in most developing countries. It's only arguably necessary in the West because we feed them such terrible diets. It doesn't have the type of cost that you're talking about. Compliance just needs hiring a couple of inspectors who generally already exist. Okay, here's the thing, right? At the point where the people in the country feel because they don't, have, they don't understand anybody as well, right? They feel that they need this large amount in order for the government to change this, these norms is going to be very hard. What does this mean? Either the government force them to not to change this norm, at which point they will hate the government and vote them out, or the government say, screw the West, I'll give it a, the, the counterfeit, I'll give it the black markets, you do whatever you want, just hate the West. We think it's a better incentive for the government to do these things. <laughs> The only way they can get they can get monitoring, right? If it's the old uh, the PM argument, right? Oh, you monitor the big doctors use things. A impossible. You don't have that many doctors to begin with in this country. Two, you only have this thing that be done in the WHO send monitors, right? A can you send thousand monitors to one country? But B, we think even if we do that, and how much the, the monitors say to doctors don't use this medicine, it will create the optics that the doctors are being oppressed by the West, that the patients are being killed by the West. We think that these things are ultimately going to be bad as well. <laughs> Moving on. Why would investors not care? This engaged group might nicely be my closing set. They're talking about, oh, we'll change big pharma, therefore we'll change the things, right? Every time there's an oligopoly of big pharma, right? you're basically a Gustav Fiskine, Pfizer, Thermo Fisher Scientific, 
the end. What does this mean? There's no real ability for you as a WHO with no, as you say, Navy or Armed Forces or any policing force to force Black Lives Matter or whatever to stop selling things, right? But B, we tell you, the only enforcement you can get is by countries, right? We don't think there's an incentive upon the major countries to even stop their, their pharma to, to, from selling, right? I.e. they want the business as well. See, even if they say, look, the Western liberal democracy will do this because they care about the British. Oh, we tell you, China won't care, India won't care, countries with generic drugs which are worse won't care. What does this mean? China and India and Russia will sell to Ghana, Sudan and Nigeria. What does this mean? It means that they, they will probably still get some kind of drug which are going to be worse at the very at the very best case they have. But we've already proven to you why the best case will never happen anyway. But moving on, what 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 ultimately what does this mean though, right? <coughs> I tell you, the comparative is very simple. On our side, what happens is you don't get the change on the government on the government level. You don't get the change on the primary level. That means that you will still get the flow of drugs even though you put a <laughs> theoretical ban on these things, right? What this means is that at the end of the day, the thing to get won't work. But let's say they get the perfect ban at the end of the day, that all these drugs will suddenly stop flowing in. What does this mean? Hey, we tell you, there's already a major problem in the, in the sense that a lot of people in these developing countries already do not buy into the concept of hospitals when they see it as, for example, Western poison, where vaccines are seen as con control of their minds. We already think there's a, there's a problem here. B, what does it mean is that at the point where this happens, they're going to result to eat either bad drugs, which will be worse, or, or B, right, they resort to things like witch doctors, right, like herbal medicines, which is all even worse because they don't work at the end of the day. But the problem is the imposition of value. When they say that, look, Western Pharma is going to be bad for you anyway, we don't want you to use these things, we think it's ultimately going to lead up to worse off outcome at the very end of the day, but people opt out of the healthcare system under these countries and don't get these things. But notice the very last thing, um, the very last frame and comparison in this debate, right? On the other side, what they get at best, is perhaps a pandemic that is controlled. They say, oh, it's okay because it's localized, right? We tell you that's not true. Pandemics can spread. If it's localized in the very first place, then it's not a problem for them to, to like not care about pandemics, right? But secondly, what we tell you, on a comparative, on our side, we get the pandemic because there's less access to drugs. The fact that these are developing countries means that means the pandemic resurgence will be a lot faster than say in the developed country, right? I mean, Cutting them from drugs for like five or ten months would already probably cause a pandemic because low health sanitation, low health care, etc. On the other side, the harm they get is a possibility of a maybe future pandemic that might happen, which by the way, we have to drop the counter. So comparing utility, on the other side, the chance of a pandemic happen and collapsing the entire global healthcare system will have happened a lot larger on, on, on like our side, but at the very worst case, we might have a chance which isn't proven that a pandemic will happen, but the harm of that is less. Why? The drugs are in these countries, the start of the pandemic is going to be smaller, we are going to be able to better contain it anyway. They fail to engage in the nuance of what, uh, what boy did in this beat, right? That is to say, they fail to engage in a case where, uh, like this is an even case where if this uh, policy were to be successful, it would lead to like substantial increase in cost for customers. It will lead to, say, customers in these developed countries who already have a mistrust towards medicine, Western medicine, to revert back to alternative medicine and much more help like damaging sources of them, which are entirely ineffective in helping them come back to that kind of things, right? I'm going to do like three things in my speech. I'm going to compare like our contributions for all the health and point to why CO telecommunications today, right? Firstly, opening government. We think opening government has a quite soft mechanism in how they're going to engage with this problem, right? 
they try to identify this from uh, flag forming ways, LA, like LEDC Big Pharma, like investors and other like uh, like slightly bigger states like China, India, right? We're going to point to why all these things do not work. Firstly, in terms of LEDs, right? We think that there's a failure in the mechanism. There's a logical gap in between like uh, explaining to us why exactly is there an incentive for LEDs to also comply with this particular mechanism, right? Then they say like we think Big Pharma is also something that they're telling myself because as Oi pointed to you very clearly in the speech, the fact that these are too big to fail, the fact that they're about often multinational means that they're also often not beholden to certain countries at a time, right? It also uh, also the fact that they're able to easily shift their base of uh, operations to other states, easy for them to just like sell to other buyers, necessarily means that they're not really caught under this mechanism, right? But the third thing that they said was that investors will really care. We think that investors don't really care, right? Like it, it, like, uh, like when we refer to it on other issues, like for example, like the fact that China's massive human rights violations doesn't mean that they suddenly stop investing, right? They care more about profits, about short-term gains, as opposed to like these substantial, meaningful things. But the four things, right, on on the idea of China. We don't think China is essentially caught under like a patent regulations. We don't think China really cares about patents in general. That's why the trade war started to a certain extent. The second thing they talked about was, a bit, was the idea of innovation, right? Look, we think that benefit for them is extremely long term. We think that because it is in these like in these states that we're really engaging in today's area, right? Which is a closing debate on the idea of developing countries. We think more often than not, than not, we simply lack the basic infrastructure for any sort of meaningful our like pharmaceutical industries to prop up, right? We think it's high, there are high initial costs to develop those medicines from scratch for those countries for those countries. So that's why we think it's unlikely for those benefits to accrue. But the third thing that they said, what, right, is the idea of bad optics, right? We think that uh, this also engages a bit, a, bit, a bit in the government's response to us, right? We think that this is, uh, this restriction is, uh, like, like for example, they, they talked about how this will lead to, like, uh, uh, more credence to international organizations, right, leads to the creation of compliance regimes. We don't think that's that easy. That's that easy. But we also say that this restriction is essentially what leads to, like, worse economic reforms and the deaths of people, right? Even if, like, we think that this leads to, like, uh, because of, fact, of the fact that, like, you don't need a massive amount of people to die in in these developing states, you just need sufficient amounts of people to die for people to become aware of these issues to create those bad optics, right? We think that is like going to be a much uh, greater priority on these developing countries uh, 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 on priority because of the fact that it's much more cognitive clo cognitively closer than like long-term benefits that they want in their side of the health, right? They're like for politicians who are like elected and voted out in, in like short elections, we don't think they really care about the long-term idea of pandemics for their nation. But moving on to closing government, right? Why we think closing government is uh, essentially like not uh, failing in their burden as well is because like we think as uh, uh, on dealing first with their extension or like why this will lead to a good a government incentive to care about sanitation standards, right? On top of what my partner has already told you on why like there's a lack of information transmission, that the fact that they can't suddenly change because of like like uh, lack of uh, capital in the in their like tax revenue or whatnot. We also point to the fact that this is simply not the priority on the voter calculus, right? Voters simply do not care about this thing as the most important thing. But also the fact that this is a low priority for politicians as well, because this is something that they can find they don't find as easy to use this inflammatory rhetoric to gain votes at elections, right? The second thing that they said was the idea that, oh, it's easier to buy, uh, like it's harder for uh, pharmaceutical companies to buy them out. We're unclear as to why this motion will lead to a low reliance on those pharmaceutical companies, right? Res presumably, in the absence of like local pharmaceutical companies who are able to meet that lack of, the, uh, lack of uh, that, that, that sudden gap of demand, we think it's still very likely that multinational pharma, big, pharma, big pharma industries are going to be still responsible for supplying like less effective drugs, right? In that case, that reliance still, uh, uh, that reliance still exists, and therefore that is the reason why they're still going to have an uh, extremely large influence over them, no. And then the third thing that they said was that incentive of pharmaceutical companies is to create, like, force them to release those patents and drugs, right? Firstly, we think that even if that's the case, there will be a short-term gap in which they have to switch products and to inform consumers that these are the new drugs they have, right? This is the where this is a period where, where you create losses for them for a pharmaceutical industry when they have to adapt and to impose in extra costs, right? But let's engage in the uh, like in the case where okay, these uh, these are. Uh, Hidden uh, patients for drugs actually exist, right? We think there's a massive incentive for them to drive up costs because they're not, they're not really, because of precisely of the reasons to make up for the short term losses that we've told you in terms of informing doctors at the local level that this, this new drug exists oh, and the one on, right? We think there's also an incentive for them to give less effective medicines uh, to, to, to make profit from them, right? But even in the case where like they do not exist, we think that this still imposes high initial costs of RD that will ultimately be transferred to consumers. Oh, information. Even in the worst case, when you have in this country, hire a bunch of inspectors and it's not quite enough and they get shut off. That's still good because hiring inspectors don't just regulate for over an antibiotic over prescription. They also catch things like doctors not washing their hands, sanitation problems like they talk about, and the benefit we give you in the PM and no one wants to engage. Uh, we think the problem is right, like 
as at, at, at the very best, you're still unable to like catch everyone who's out, who's down there at the local level, right? Like, look, we, we already no excuse. She already told you what right? the fact that there are rent, like many extremely small number of hospitals. That's the reason why it makes it extremely hard for you to track down every single one of them, right? Then the fourth thing that we heard from the closing government is the idea that okay, there's one, uh, like it's hard harder to like for bad optics to accrue. We think it's much e like the bad optics on our side of the house still accrues because of the fact that it's e because of the fact that these developing countries are able to perceive that it's easier for Western states to comply, right? They perceive that the ability for them to meet up with those standards is much easier for the Western, Western countries because they already have an existing infrastructure. They already have a vast, vastly greater amount of hospitals, right? We're also saying you don't need a lot of people to die for that uh, for the idea to appear, right? You just need a sufficient amount of people within your population to die for that idea to come. But then the last thing they said, what, right, was the idea that it's easier to regulate agricultural usage, right? And the only example they gave was feeding animals, which doesn't covers the entirety of what agricultural usage really looks like, right? We think short term losses will still accrue because they need time to find new supplies and to re-adapt the infrastructure and the machines to use those kind of new kinds of uh, 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 drugs, right? But what's the harm here, right? The response here we gave you on this closing officer is that you lead to crops failing. You lead to farmers losing their main source of sustenance. You lead to like uh, individuals starving a lot more. You affect the global su food supply chain, right? These are concrete harms that they have to deal with. So why ultimately do we think closing officer takes over our opening position? Right? We think we were, we were the only team on off who have meaningfully engaged in the context where this policy does work, right? That's not in, like that, that's not a contradiction, that's just even the case in which we're being more responsible, right? We think that this uh, we the benefits that uh, the substantive that my partner finds you was the, on the idea of like leading to more uh, usage of alternative medicine where you hurt customers because they have to pay for more expensive drugs. But more importantly, right, we think that we're the only house on off to engage in the more important context, right? The context where more people die, which is the case of like uh, LEDCs, right? It is only in my partner's speech that you heard the more relevant and more detailed characteristics as to how this motion will play out in the less, uh, less developing countries, right? Both based on all the reasons, but we're very proud to oppose.